focus is the best that we can do. I think it may be. Okay, just so that you know, this, it opens with a uh, statement of Mayor Baba's words from the chairman of the Avatar Mayor Baba PPC Trust. This is from Sridhar Kelker, who's the chairman right now. Um, I uh, didn't mention, but in um, you may or may not know that Mayor Baba had a last will and testament. <laughs> Uh, in 1959 that he signed. And uh, the main topic uh, dealt with in it is his copyrights, actually. I think there are seven clauses and one is sort of an intro and one of them deals with the pumpkin house and things like that. But the main topic is actually his copyrights. And uh, except for those which he had already given to the Sufis, he left them to the uh, Avatar Mirababa Trust. So Schreeder is speaking as the chairman of the trust, which uh, manages them. So in this, I'll talk about this tomorrow afternoon, but this is an explanation of uh, why this is treated as Baba's words and in what sense it is treated as uh, Baba's words and uh, things about the editing of it done. So this matter is, is dealt with right up front, right from the very start. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction in a minute. But then you get the actual talks and they're organized by date. So most of them are Maribad. Uh There are one or two that are in other places, Lenavla and so forth. So it gives date and uh, place. And uh, they have, um, they open with these little blurbs which we put in. And the thought in the presentation of all of this uh, is uh, that, I mean, I very strongly feel for my own part that um, these are talks that are uh, situated in very specific contexts. Um, they're by somebody to somebody, by Meher Baba, Sri Sadhguru Meher Baba, to his men Mandali. Something like the discourses are actually uh, composed to be comparatively context free so that you can just pick up the books and read them and even if you don't know who Meher Baba is you can actually uh, get what they have. Of course it's always good to know who Meher Baba is but uh, if you don't uh, you can understand them anyway. But I really do think in the case of these Tiffin lectures, you, it's it's specific to a time and place. I mean, it's a sort of a stupid example. Let's suppose somebody went to see Baba in Pune and Baba said, um, catch the 8 o'clock train back to Bombay. Okay. So, let's suppose you publish that. Catch the 8 o'clock train back to Bombay, Avatar Me So everybody, to all time, is supposed to do that. It's obviously a particular time and place to a particular person. So these Tiffin lectures are, have a, that aspect to them more strongly in that they're really meant for a particular group. So it, you do need to know about that. So for all of them, we would put something about the context or background or things like that about the Tiffin lectures. About the ones, what had been going on at Maribad or if there was some particular context. So there are, are 52 of them. Um, most of them were taken from that one manuscript. A couple we took directly from Chanji's diaries. And then once you, I guess this is the last one, uh, Tuesday, 30th August. Uh, and after this, um, there's first there begins with an essay uh, establishing the text of Tiffin Lectures, historical and textual backgrounds and editorial practices. So the first part of this gives uh, some of the, it's kind of what we were dealing with this morning, some of the uh, historical background uh, of the period, what Baba was doing, what was going on at Mirabad. And actually, if you want a short history of early Mirabad, this is a very good place to go. It's in 10 pages or so. And it goes over some of the literary stuff going on. Here Baba is in Lenavla. Um, and after this is um, a section on the documentary sources of it. And uh, 
So it goes over, you know, what the different diaries were, the typed sources, the uh, uh, handwritten diary sources, where they're kept, um, the, uh, uh, a bunch of them are at the archives in uh, India, the Phyllis Frederick papers are with the Pearsons. Um, Nashawan has significant material, stuff like that. It goes over all this and what their relative place was. And I think these original documents for the Tiffin lectures um, are going back to the uh, Avatar Mirabava Trust as being Baba's own words. And then there is a whole bunch of other stuff um, Okay, I'll talk about more of this tomorrow, but the, all, all, these various appendixes are in general um, about uh, the uh, documentary sources. But here's another section, I'm mentioning this because we may or may not go back, get back to it, but there's a, a particular topic that comes up in a way that's quite ambiguous. And it's uh, about, Baba explains how different parts of the body what their cosmological significance is. Um, and that's a branch of esoteric tradition all over the world that you'll find in yoga and Taoism and many different places. And Baba has said enough about it to where there's, he clear, there's clearly some reality to it. And there's some of it in the Tiffin lectures too. It's quite interesting. Uh, so this particular um, uh, appendix goes over uh, some of that. And there's a lot, also this, uh, there's a lot of curious stuff in the Tiffin lectures, particularly in one of them, about the circles of the Sadhguru. We may get to that this afternoon. But there's material that we didn't know before. There are a, a couple in the book that we put in and said so. The overwhelming majority of those in the published book are based on um, uh, diagrams that were in the source materials. Now how did they get into the source materials? Um, I guess we don't have explicit information on it, but it seems overwhelmingly probable that Baba gave them. Because he was writing himself and he always used diagrams throughout his whole life on this kind of subject matter. There is one reference to a Chanji in 1927 August, it says Chanji brought some diagrams for Sri's review and approval. Now we don't know what the work in question was, but it's very likely either this or infinite intelligence. Um, so it's just a presumption, but it seems overwhelmingly probable that Baba gave the original diagrams because he liked to do it. A lot of these things we don't have. I mean, they didn't bother to write this down. It was so obvious to all of them. But there's a lot of stuff about the circles of the Sadhguru that's quite new. And um, um, let's see. I'm just going to. Um, and also, there's a section here called Notes on the Figures. Um, so this gives information about all the figures. Uh, that is to say, what the sources were. Um, and on the Trust website, I show you, showed you that this morning, right, under Tiffin Lectures. Uh, if you go under there on the figures, uh, you, every figure is shown as in the book, and all the source figures are also shown along with their manuscript sources. So you, because the figures are an important part of it, and there's been an interpretive dimension involved in their recreation for the book, because sometimes they're very primitive, and we've had to sort of try to figure out what they mean, or else they obviously need to get made more artistic or developed. And, you know, there's, you know, one can very well raise questions about that. Uh, so if you do, all the information about sources is given here. And on the website also, you'll see, you can go look at the original diagrams. And in fact, uh, one of the, Merwan Jesawala is the other editor of this, and uh, he specifically requested that, um, along with the original figures, uh, right there, there would be a key to the figure, and one, at least one of the uh, sources would be put there too.
so you can get a glimpse of what they would look like. And I know this is the part that you all are going to rush to right at the beginning, the end notes. I mean, it's just fantastic. This phrase in the Tiffin Leffick manuscripts, TL, TTLFFP1, TTLP1, TLDFF, 29-426, draft A, P1, and draft B. I mean, man, this is thriller. <laughs> and uh, if you go to the Trust website, all of those uh, references are highlighted and you can click it. In the future, there will be a lot of people who go to all this material. You know, and then I'm sure. And also, I'll just say one of the purposes is to kind of set a bar. If you're going to present stuff as the words of the avatar, you got to let no people know what the sources are. I just really feel that. So you guys may go into this and tear this edition to, to pieces, um, have the um, editors lynched, although Marwan's already passed away, too late in his case, and do your own edition that's far, far better. And, um, and also, and after that, uh, there's also a, you know, a very full glossary. And um, one of the reasons why this would matter, um, these words are, are to be found in the Tiffin lectures. But a lot of uh, what Baba gave, a lot of his dictation, was probably in Gujarati. I mentioned this this morning. It's only presumptive. We don't actually know. But if you have in Chanji's record of his dictation an alternation between Gujarati and English, what would have been his reason for having done that, except that Baba did? I mean, it would make no sense because Chanji could perfectly well record in whatever language. I mean, does some of you have a counter reason to this? So it's just a, it's just a presumption. But uh, that would seem to suggest that a lot of the actual verbiage of Meher Bhavas was in the language of Gujarati. And also there's some Urdu and uh, some Marathi here and there and Persian, those languages, which he was very fluent in. So if you really want to sort of find dig into what Meher Baba said, um, actually. What are Meher Baba's words? Well, this would um, give some uh, a way of approach to that, uh, along with the diaries. And of course, as soon as you finish the end notes, I'm sure you'll just want to read the index, which is e almost as thrilling as the end notes are. So this is what the book itself looks like as a whole, just a, a glance at it. Um, and as I say, I really do think editions of Baba's words that were not published in his own lifetime need to be done this way, you know, um, where all the sources are all, anyway, I'm a, I feel that very strongly. Or, or, or the avatar's words, if you don't do it, it's an invitation to corrupt his words. Here's a little bit, I'm going to read from this introduction because it gives um, some I. A idea of the uh, the context of the actual delivery of these things. Imagine a scene such as the following. Mihir Baba is seated on a chair or stool in the family quarters. You remember the family quarters, right? The Kaka Shahane. Kaka Shahane is his name, disciple of Mihir Baba, who um, lived in the family quarters on the edge of Erangan village. Um, or perhaps in the Makanikas, the men's dormitory in Mirabad, a stack of slates has been placed beside him. His disciples are spread out in a semicircle, seated cross-legged on the cow dung flooring. By the way, for those of you who haven't actually experienced it, cow dung floorings are really nice. They, they really are. They're, they're very comfortable. You might not think so, but actually, you remember uh, John, what they're like? Yeah, I mean, they're very sanitary and they're uh, cool and, you know, quite pleasant. Most of them, Rustam, Padri, Pindu, Adi, Gustaji, Gani, Ramju, Vishnu, these are the personalities on the scene, right? Intimate Mandali. Arjun, Pandava, brothers Bharam and Jal are still young men in their early 20s or 30s. All are watching intently as Baba 
who have been keeping silence since 10th July 1925, gesticulates with his silent hand signs and facial expressions, nonverbal communication interspersed with writing as he turns to the slate and jots down words with chalk in English and Gujarati. Meanwhile, an interpreter, such as Adi or Vishnu, is reading out Baba's gestures, and these spoken words give explicit articulation to a meaning that is made so much more vivid by Baba's own eloquent and fluent enactment of it through face and body language. Baba pauses and looks up at the interpreter, nodding in confirmation, or perhaps correcting an, in, an inaccurate phrase, glancing around the room to make sure that the men have grasped his sense, sometimes repeating a thought, or singling out one of the disciples to mark a point, now and again cracking a joke, and in general, engaging the attention and driving home what he wanted to convey to this group of intimate associates. When Baba has finished with the slate, it is passed along to Chanji, who is meticulously recording the transaction. In this way, much of Baba's own verbiage, both written and spoken, gets incorporated into Chanji's transcript. The slate, when Chanji is done with it, gets returned for wiping clean in use in another round of dictation. Now, none of this has ever been described anywhere. This is all just a you know, a guess, but from what we know of Baba's method, this seems to me probably what happened. That is, I would guess that Baba would be writing out something, and if the interpreter, who would be very experienced at doing this, um, had heard it before, and following closely, might finish up the sentence, and Baba might nod, right, so that Baba didn't have to write it out. I'm just guessing this, but from Baba's method, it would, I think it's very unlikely that he would actually um, dictate or write out every single word in something. I don't think that was his style. He would give the idea. Or else, I remember uh, Balna too one time explaining that um, like Baba would give, Bal used this example, infinite, God is infinite. And when you would see Baba make that gesture, it's like, you would say, oh my God, infinite. You'd get an idea of what it meant. But when you're just reading the book, it's flat, you know, it's just infinite this, infinite that, nothing. So a big part of it was, I mean, if you really want to know what Baba's words were, the, the real answer is this, you had to be there, actually. It was a performance, it was Baba being there. But the Mandali were very experienced and were writing down an account of what he said. So that's, I think, what we have. If you want to say, are these literally Baba's words? No, I don't think we have that for anything except in God's hand. I don't think God speaks was either, matter of fact. So here's an example of, a, here's a little... So if any of you happen to have any particular tip and topic or anything, I'm willing to sort of go with the flow and all of it. Do you want to read it? The Yogis are able at best to concentrate their minds and see, only see the light. And even this much they can accomplish only if they reach the sixth plane. Now as to the voice that we hear, the voice of others and our own voice too, what is it and whence does it arise? That voice wells from within seven curtains inside. Yet despite this, how quickly it is heard. Mark the time that the movement of the voice through the seven curtains starts and finishes, and you will be surprised at the extraordinarily quick rate in which the voice travels. That is, originating behind seven curtains within the speaker, it passes out and then enters it again through seven more curtains. So many within the ears of the hearer or hearers, arriving at last at their own innermost self. The voice itself is the gross form of thought, the thought that itself is subtle, while the voice that carries it is gross. But these two, the gross and the subtle, cannot become one. This is the difficulty that ordinary human beings face. On a daily basis, you think a thousand and one thoughts in your mind, which you do, which you do not put into action, that is, expressed through your voice which is the gross form. In general, only a few of these thoughts are given the gross form of voice. 
Yet these thoughts in subtle form do not get transferred to the voice emit light, that is, faint impressions of light blue color, which can easily be wiped off. But if they are given gross form, this is what I want to emphasize. Yeah. If they are transferred to voice, then they acquire a deep blue color that naturally is difficult to wash away. In just the same way, if desires, which are thoughts, after all, creep into your mind, and if you refrain from giving them the gross form of use by putting them into action through word or deed, then they show again this faint light blue color. But if you put them into action through words or deeds, the impression is deep blue. Anger creates impressions of a red color. Indeed, every thought, word, and action brings impressions with it. That is why it has been advised, let your mind go, even if it wanders astray, but do not let your body go where the mind goes. That is, do not give subtle thoughts and desires any gross form by putting them into action, for then they will acquire much deeper impressions, and much worse, if the actions are evil. Anyway, uh, that was, that was so good for me because sometimes I backbite and I'm mm. realizing that what I'm happening is so bad. So you deepen. I'm not, not going to say much. Oh, <laughs> you could say wonderfully good things and get wonderfully bright, yeah. splendorous impressions. But what a lesson, wow. Here's another thing, but this is about the color of impressions. I've never seen anything. There's a little bit of the halo, the aura and the halo. Um, a discourse published in the Awakener, but apart from that, I've never seen about the color of impressions before. Have you guys? I don't know, maybe Phyllis talked about it, could be. But here, intense longing for anything, and longing is a form of desire, creates a green color, which is rightly considered the best color of all from a spiritual standpoint, for it is closest to the Satchitanan state as is shown in figure 25 on the next page. Uh, Mara's favorite color was green. Yeah, Mara's favorite color. And I think in Sufism... Muhammad's huh? color green. That's right, in Islam and Sufism, the highest color is regarded as green. What about the... What's the color for lust? I didn't see that. Red. 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 I thought that was anger. Yeah, and, and for anger too. So... I've never seen a full, thorough discussion of this topic, but this is a little bit. So here's a, like, a, this is a part of the philosophy of uh, doing the diagrams, you see. We made that green uh, because it's, uh, and it's based on a source like this. So this is really a primitive diagram. So we had to do a lot of uh, reconstruction, yeah. Didn't Bob talk about the colors uh, in the making of his flag? He was uh, telling people where to put white colors on the flag. Yeah, I don't r I think, am I right about this? He never explained what the significance of those colors were, did he? Because there was a fight. The Hindu Mandali wanted a red flag, and the Muslim Mandali wanted a, a green flag. <laughs> a little bit of favorite is you know bias there coming into the picture whereas obviously the right color would have been red right and blue right <laughs> but, but we heard that or I heard that that he wanted red at the bottom and blue at the top it's kind of symbolizing the, that the red is not yeah but of course the blue is not the highest yeah. green is yeah I know maybe Baba got confused or maybe that was not a real story yeah yeah that was one of those yeah sources. I don't know yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe why Bob maintaining silence. He doesn't put it into action. I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, it is interesting when you and part of what this all relates to uh, that he was talking about the seven curtains and everything is that uh, um, we actually have subtle senses. We have gross senses, but subtle senses are actually different from our gross senses. So like when you hear something, it has it passes through your gross senses, from there to your subtle senses, and from there to your mind, and ultimately to the self. And Bob is making the point this happens almost instantaneously. It's a very quick connection, even though it has to go up the seven planes to get to where you are, the real you. What do you think about someone who like never takes a breath when they talk? I, I, mm. I, I have a friend who um, all in agreement with uh, whom all are in agreement 
just talks so much and it's so fast. And yeah, mm. the bread, so it's like you're trying to play not for you. Wait a minute, I want to jump in. But I There's never a spot. And so uh, the end of the is just flying even faster for that person or something. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I would imagine just their minds are going so fast. And also, the uh, um, there must be some kind of checks and restraints of some sort between the mind and the actual vocalization of it. And some people, their checks and restraints work better than they do for other people. <laughs> Yes, Sheila Krinsky did the layout and she did the diagrams also. Diagrams are an important part of Baba's method, particularly on philosophical or discourse type matters from the very beginning. Um, so uh, this, this is an example of the practice. Here's the uh, redrawn diagram and there's the source diagram or one of them. And if you want to see all the rest of them, you can find them. Uh, on the trust website, as I mentioned, they're all given there. Here's another one. Now, here's the diagram uh, that was not given in the original, but Bob is talking about uh, the uh, parts of the coconut, comparing them to different aspects of the false self. So we thought it'd be a good idea just to illustrate it by showing from a from a, an actual coconut. There. Um, this is. The mind when it's oriented towards the world, and this is the mind when it turns around and is oriented back towards uh, the self, the real self. We spent a long time thinking about these diagrams. I can really tell you as the there's a lot of reasons for the way that these things have been done. So here we have the states of unconsciousness, subconsciousness, consciousness in the human form, sub-superconsciousness, and conscious sound sleep. And uh, this is a big theme at Marana. We spent a long time talking about the three states of sound sleep, dream, and wakefulness. And uh, this is a big part of Meher Baba's, and we're using the word darshana, so as not to have to use this horrible word philosophy. His, his presentation, his exposition of truth. Um, that's what darshana means. And um, this really is a big part of it. Um, Western uh, science uh, would not subscribe to this view uh, because these are just regarded as psychological states, part of the epiphenomenon of consciousness, which to a materialist doesn't even exist at all. But in uh, Baba's account, which is right aligned to Vedanta here, sounds like dream and wakefulness are primordial cosmological principles uh, relating to the very structure of reality itself. So there are a number of charts in, uh, and discussions in the course of Tiffin lectures relating to this. It's there in God Speaks also. Infinite intelligence is all over the place. Let's see. Okay, here's a... Uh, this, uh, this diagram also was not in the original, but it, the description of it was there. It's, I, I don't have it right here, but uh, these are described as layers, one inside the other. So we did this diagram just to make it more quickly intelligible. And by the way, you know, th this was part of the spirit of this thing. We said, though the manuscript sources give no diagram here, this description of the false self, etc. In other words, we always say when the, there is no source diagram in the manuscript. In the great majority of cases, there are. So here's one. Um, okay, I could talk a long time about this. That's the original source. One of the original sources is. Uh, oops, sorry. Just going to expand it, but didn't succeed. Yeah, right there. So you can see this is in the form of a circle diagram on an original page. Um, I'll just jump. Anyway, let's just scroll through these just to give you an idea of what they look like. The original is here, and uh, so we just reproduced it. 
we don't really know what it means. There's no explanation of it that's very good. Mm. Okay. What's your favorite? What's your favorite? Diagram? No. You know, I'm kind of like a mother. I like the. Mo if you, anyone says this one, I say, no, no, but don't forget about that one. It's hard for me to say. I really would have a hard time saying. Yeah, this was a uh, curious thing. Um, these little squiggle marks. We didn't know what on earth they meant until we found out that it's Urdu script. Mav, yeah. That was a, we were just going to give up on it. And then Jean Gusev suddenly said, hey, that's Urdu. Because we thought, from the uh, source, which is right, well, this is an example of a source. Um, oops, sorry. We didn't know what to make of it, but it looked meaningful. Anyway, you can't see it very well here, but uh, there are a lot of uh, things like this. So here's a, Baba sometimes used these circle diagrams. There's one in God Speaks. Um, so this was the original. This is a type of diagram that Baba did a lot, where he shows individualities. In this case, uh, it's different Mandali members. As rays emanating from a sun, or as drops emanating from an ocean. You'll find a bunch of this in infinite intelligence also. It's one of the trademarks of... So this is similar in that respect. Here's another one showing the different states. Sound sleep, dream, wakefulness, dream, sound sleep. There's a diagram much like this in God Speaks. And there's a lot of significance in this, much more than you might think. In fact, in In God's Hand, uh, Baba's handwritten thing, there's a diagram just like this that he did himself. Um, this one, we put this in. You may recognize this is Mr. Leonardo da Vinci. And it is, uh, the different parts of the body have a significance uh, that Baba explains here. So this is an example of what we call subtle physiology. The general generality of humanity is represented by the navel, the lower planes of consciousness by this part of the body. This is the fifth plane, this is the sixth plane, and that's the seventh. This was one of the uh, cases where um, uh, we had a manuscript um, where the key words were all missing. They were, it's called a lacuna. That's in the manuscript if you have just a, a gap or a blank. And they were meant to be filled in by uh, Gujarati words in 15 years. Um, I didn't know if it was navel or the base of the spine or the genitals or what the heck. I had no idea um, what these words were to be. And then in the Phyllis Frederick manuscripts, there were the words right there. It was really... Uh, so these are really the chocolate you're talking about? Like these are the chocolate? Well, that's what I had thought at first, but now I don't think so because the navel is not exactly the base chakra or anything. Um, so this will really be something for people to work out, I think. I'm not a I'm sort of a physiological guy, you know, or a doctor or anything like that. There's another um, talk to the Mir Ashram boys um, on this topic too that's very interesting. I spent two hours on the phone with Bob Ahrens, I don't know if you know him, asking him about uh, the, but the, apparently the big toe represents, the little toe is stone form, the big form, toe is um, human form, the ankle is the first plane, this is the second plane, the fourth plane is here, the fifth plane here. So it seems that the human body has a profound cosmological significance. Uh, Baba never did explain it all, though. There are just hints here and there. But this is one of the hints. It's in this particular uh, Tiffin lecture. So is that like the, ch the chest in general or the lungs being pointed to? Um, I think that's pointing to the th right at the base of the throat here, yeah. Maybe like with a heart? Not in this Tiffin lecture. Uh, there's a lot more I would have to say about that. 
but they're just guesses because um, the information is incomplete and also it's not exactly my field. But I think it's a topic that people who are interested in this might want to dig into. One of the, uh, I mentioned one of the appendixes, appendix four is on subtle physiology. That's this subject. The cosmological significance of the human body. You know, Baba said, and I've never heard before that any master revealed this previously, um, that the human uh, form is the only form in existence. That every form is actually the human form not yet fully manifested. So he even gave the example of a rock. He said a rock is like a cloth human doll all folded up on itself. But if you have the eyes to see, you would see that a rock has a nose and a mouth and ears and eyes and all of that is there. But it's all folded and collapsed so that you don't see it. So that actually there is only one form in existence and it's the human form. Now that's new. Did you know that before Baba said it? I certainly didn't. Yes, sir? Well, I've seen it. Also, I figured I said this last year, I've seen it in the Jewish Is it there? I mean, I know that... I'd like to see. I mean, I know that you have in Judaism the Bible, the Torah. Um, the mystical. <laughs> that the human form is everywhere, is in all things. That's a subject worth exploring. I mean, of course, in the in the. Torah, you have it that man was made in the image of God. That part's there. And in Islam, you have a, an idea that you could, the al-insan al-kamal, the perfect man, you could relate these ideas to it. But the idea that the human form is actually latent, latent in every form. Yeah. What's that? The embryo goes through those stages. Yeah. This is really a subject worth exploring for people with that interest and uh, who would have something. I, I personally think we're going to get people like Ibn Arabi who will come along and really explain a lot of this. But this, I feel about myself, that this, we're in the glorious phase of amateur hour. It's sort of like. <laughs> Kibitzers can come in and say they're two bits. In another 200 years, Ibn Arabi will shut us all up. But for the present, <laughs> we looked at this one. Um, yeah, this was an interesting diagram. This shows um, how miracles are done. Um, this, this is, the sun means paramatma and this is the world and a yogi is located in the intermediate zones. And um, for a yogi, rays come from the sun and the yogi sort of combines them, so to speak, and produces miracles. But the sadguru, Baba said, doesn't need to do that um, because a yogi experiences, a yogi means someone on the plains. Um, a yogi, like if I'm going to perform some miraculous manipulation with some object, I experience that object as separate from myself. But the sadguru, if I'm, the sadguru experiences himself as that thing and doesn't need to manipulate anything. He can do it directly. In fact, Baba said in one of these Tiffin lectures that um, well, here's how a yogi performs a miracle in this way. Um, the, there, he said there are seven layers of, I think it's electricity, I think that's what he was using, um, within himself. And there are seven layers of electricity in the atmosphere. Now what that means, Baba didn't explain. Did he mean the seven planes? Did he mean seven levels of prawn? I don't, I don't know. But what the yogi does is he, t he combines the third layer of electricity within himself and unites it with the third layer in the atmosphere at large and just thinks of the thing he wants to achieve and it's done that way. That's interesting, huh? 
But as a Sadhguru doesn't need to do anything like that. He can do it directly without manipulations of that kind. So that comes up in one of the Tiffin lectures, and this diagram is uh, related to that general idea. Um, here's uh, some interesting information for people, for scientists of Sanskaras. Uh, Baba uh, explained that at the beginning of evolution, actually the originals are a bit hard to see, but uh, it's here somewhere, yeah, right there and right there. I know they're too hard, they're too small to see here. But um, at the beginning of evolution, um, sanskaras are coiled. Um, but at the end of evolution, at the end of evolution, not in, not uh, reincarnation or involution, at the end of evolution, they're, it's like a sine wave, but it said it, they have a, a snake's bite. And Baba didn't seem to explain what he meant by that, but this thought occurs to me that um, in the beginning of evolution, sanskaras have very little energy. They just sort of, I don't know, maybe they ooze out of the own point and they just generally coil because they don't have the energy to do anything else. But by the end of evolution, your sanskaras have got a bite to them. You know, <laughs> ow! You know, the sanskaras have some impact. So that's some new information about the actual shape of it. I sent this to a Baba lover who's a mathematician and he sent me back three or four pages and they're very interesting. Did you want to say something, Larry? Oh, yeah. yeah. In fact, if we had time, I could show you a uh, something that shows uh, the relation between a sine wave and a circle, a geometric relation, which is... I, I think a lot of this stuff, in the future, people will really um, fathom this stuff a lot more and discover all kinds of secrets by means of it. Um, Okay, uh, this is this what this diagram shows. Uh, it's based on those diagrams there, but this is about sanskaras and uh, the mind. And for ordinary people in reincarnation, uh, the mind goes back and forth, back and forth. I don't know. Have you ever seen a grandfather clock? It, it sort of goes. Vroom, vroom. Isn't there a pendulum type thing? Right, it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's the normal process. Uh, so in your sanskaras, you spend them and get new ones and spend them and get new ones. Well, with, in the case of a, uh, there's the uh, disciples of a perfect master, he gets it so that the, it goes only in one direction. It never goes backwards. So maybe that's why being with Baba was so... Uh, at a certain point, it's like, hey, stop, cool it, Baba, you know. <laughs> Lay off a little bit. Because you just, it was just the unwinding of sanskaras with no reverse happening. So that's what this diagram shows and what the Tiffin lecture is talking about. Yeah? I don't remember the story, but maybe you recall a comment Baba made about when you become attached to the experience of time becomes different is that time is actually moving faster. And I wonder how that's connected. I imagine some way connected to the, the unwind of sense cars and that, that, that the experience of time is somehow affected by it. Yeah, I don't know. I know Baba says that time on the gross plane is different from time on the subtle plane and that's different from time on the mental plane. But I never saw where Baba said how. Which is faster, which is slower? Does anybody know? Anybody here in the subtle or mental planes? Yeah, there he is. But you, your lips are sealed, right? Yeah, that's the problem with these people on the planes. They can't tell us anything. Now this is a, um, was a, is a very significant diagram. And this was a real piece of news. It's a piece of spiritual news, actually. And um, this is a, you may be acquainted with um, Hindu spiritual tradition, uh, according to which there are three great paths. Sometimes they say four, but the path of knowledge, action, and uh, devotion. Jnana, Shakti, uh, uh, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, 
and bhakti yoga are the names for it. Are you acquainted with this, some of you? Um, the Bhagavad Gita deals with this very extensively. The Bhagavad Gita is a, a great master exposition on this subject. Uh, but Baba has uh, often um, brought this into his explanations too. The deeper aspects of sadhana. Some of you who have done the discourses may remember that. Uh, it's about those three. He doesn't use the names Gyan Karma Shakti, but uh, uh, Gyan Kama Bhakti, but that's what he means clearly. Well, that we knew. But here, what Baba did was he linked them with the triune nature of God as knowledge, power, and bliss. I, I mean, that's actually a very... We spent two whole sessions at Marana on these things. Knowledge, power, bliss is a fundamental trinity of Meher Baba's. And so far as I can ascertain, um, it's new. I, I don't know of a place in spiritual tradition where this trinity has been given before. And when I've said this from time to time, people have said, oh, it's here, it's there, but I want to see it. I, I don't, actually. I've been looking for 15 years. But Sat and Ananda is different. Sat and doesn't mean that, actually. Sat means truth. Chit means consciousness. And Anand means bliss. Truth, consciousness, bliss. That's not knowledge, power, bliss. There's no power term there. It's, it's, it, I don't think anyone in the history of Indian thought would ever have construed such and not such and not as knowledge, power, bliss. Yeah. You know what? I've always thought about that statement because power would be right. And so maybe mm -hmm. I, I was 17 I think, when I read the discourses. So yeah. I always assumed, or everybody knows that. It must be all. So it's really striking for me to hear. Oh, it is awesome. Well, if, if anyone knows me to be wrong, please let me know. I don't want to go around saying this. But I've been looking for a long time. I mean, of course, every spiritual tradition is going to deal with knowledge or with power or with bliss. You can't fail to treat those topics. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about as a trinity. Um, that is the nature of God. That seems to originate with Mihir Baba. Sam, did you ever bump across this with Krishnamurti or anybody? No. Knowledge, power, bless? No, the, I, I just kind of thought that such an honor was roughly equivalent. Well, not, but, it, but I can see that it's not. It's well, the, here's the thing that Baba actually uses such an anand as a gloss for knowledge, power, bliss, a number of times. It's there. But it doesn't actually mean that. That's one of the uh, puzzles of all of this. But knowledge, power, bliss is really fundamental to Meher Baba's darshana, if I may use that word, because knowledge, power, bliss is the foundation of the mental, subtle, and gross spheres, and the mental, subtle, and gross bodies. So the knowledge aspect of God is reflected in the mind, our mental bodies. The power aspect of God's nature is shadowed in our subtle bodies. Those both make sense, right? And But the one that's a little bit surprising is the bliss aspect is shadowed in our gross bodies. And Baba definitely says this. I mean, we could go over all the places where he does. Okay, well that much was already there from God Speaks. But now we find that there's a link with the three paths. So now that's quite interesting. So you see what a powerful... For people who want to understand the cosmos and the spiritual path, this is an unbelievably huge idea. That is, the path of knowledge, it, Gyanmarg, leads to the realization of God's nature as knowledge. Okay, well that makes sense, right? And the uh, karma marg, do you know what karma marg, karma yoga, karma? Action. And so action necessarily implies the use of, of power, right? You can't act without power. So you're drawing on God's nature as power. And so that lead and it's a it's 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 a yoga because you're doing it selflessly. It's selfless service. 
Um, so uh, it makes sense that that would be linked to God's nature as power. And uh, bhakti marg, devotion, which in its higher aspect is, uh, is love, um, parabhakti, Baba calls it in one of the discourses, um, that is based on God's nature as bliss. So, I mean, I think that's really a fascinating uh, piece of information. It was really this chart that sealed the deal because this chart was missing in the, the copy of Tiffin Lectures we had been working with for 15 years. <laughs> it was this big blank and it ate my heart out until this showed up in the, uh, in the form of this among Phyllis's papers. That wasn't there in what we had. Yeah. So this is the uh, so God bless him. Baba, it's stupid to say that for having these sent to Phyllis because we got them. Yeah. What's the bhakti yoga? Bhakti means devotion, and it's these things are huge in Hinduism. You know, absolutely huge. I would say that bhakti is the has been for. A thousand years, the dominant aspect of Hindu uh, worship. It would be bhajan, singing songs to Krishna or to, you know, Shiva, um, uh, love songs or uh, worship, that, that's bhakti. Um, in its higher aspect, Baba gave it the term parabhakti, which is real love. Bhakti, rites, rituals, rituals and ceremonies are actually the lower um, expression of bhakti. But in the higher forms of it, you would get Mirabai um, or St. Francis of Assisi, you know, that, that kind of higher love. He, they were bhakti in their style. So this is a very significant chart that uh, showed up. And I think that's the last one in the whole book.